I mean, this is a, it's an extremely emotional text for me. Um, I, I preach this every church that I get a chance to preach very often to. You probably have heard this before from me. Uh, in some ways, this has become a constant pain and truth um, for my life. I, I think it's... Um, Well, let me illustrate what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm going to be preaching out of Ephesians 4, so I hope you'll turn there. I'm going to be dealing with the first paragraph, verses 1 through 6. I think the uh, theme of the whole book of Ephesians could be unity. I think it starts in chapter 1, verse 10, the summing up of all things in Christ. This will be the first sermon out of the practical section. Um, I would say to you, doctrine without Christ-likeness is an abomination to God. It's not what we know. It's how we live what we know. Several years ago, I, uh, Peggy and I got to go to the uh, Baptist World Alliance in uh, uh, Birmingham, England. It was the first year that uh, Southern Baptist Convention had pulled out of the Baptist World Alliance. I thought to myself, why? Why would we do that? And the answer was, well, the Baptist World Alliance uh, focuses on uh, drilling wells and uh, helping people learn how to grow more crops. And, um, and we're into uh, evangelism. And I thought to myself, oh, God, those don't go together some way. We're going to get them to trust Christ and then starve to death. We're going to tell them God loves them and leave them with dirty water. The truth is that these two groups desperately need each other. And that's true in every church. Because the groups in the church tend to push the envelope too far. And the other groups bring a balance to the body. But what we've done in America, when we join a church, we find a church that acts like us, talks like us, thinks like us, and we join that church. So we got all the, all the livers over here, all the kidneys over here, all the colons. I've been to that church over here. <laughs> and every one of those body parts stands up and says... We're closer to God than you are. The arrogance of modern denominationalism just appalls me. I guarantee if your great-grandfather was here who was a Baptist, he would be appalled at how we do church today. And yet somehow we think we think that our views, our doctrine, our way of worship, our music is the way God would do it. I assure you that's not true. And the arrogance even continues when we send our missionaries overseas to make white Anglo-Saxon churches around the world. You're just not that hot, sucker. It just doesn't depend on you. You're just not the only voice, the only thought, the only way. You don't have all the truth. But you are called on to be a part of the body of Christ. We are a body. It's almost like a body at war with itself. Which makes an unhealthy body. And people say, well, if our group would only win, friends, there are no them and us. Do you know that? If one faction wins, the body of Christ loses because our strength is our diversity. Because the world wants to see us love one another when we don't get along, not a whole bunch of folks who think and act and smell just alike. I have just, um, 
As you know, I'm going through the upper room discourses of, of uh, the Last Supper on Sunday nights. We're only in chapter 16, but when we get to 17, you're going to realize that Jesus prays something three times and really alludes to it another time. It's in 1711, 1721, 1723, and talked about in 1723, 21, 22, and then talked about in 23, and that's this. Father, I pray that they be one, even as we are one. Now, whatever we may have done right, we have not done that. Whatever, whatever we think we can pat ourselves on the back about, we have not done that. I was so impressed by the promise keepers. I was impressed because here was a group of guys that got together to worship Jesus, pray together, praise together, gather, encourage, affirm, without having to agree on theological issues. I go overseas a lot, at least I did in the past. I think I did something like 37 of these evangelistic mission trips. When I get overseas, in a sea of unbelievers, and I meet somebody who knows Jesus, do you think for a minute I ask them what denomination they're a part of? Our success in America with a church on every corner is appalling for our lack of fellowship, love, and prayer for one another. And that we have allowed the evil one to dispense competition among us, even within denominations, even within churches. I think I'd just cry for 30 minutes if I thought it'd help. I don't quite know what to do. I... The strongest way we tell Jesus that we love him is we love those for whom he died. And if we are not loving those for whom he died, please don't tell me how much you love him. Verses 1 through 6 haunt me. They, they really do haunt me. Now this, um, this text is very practical because... It's going, in verses 2 and 3, it's going to tell us the individual, purposeful, intentional, daily actions and attitudes that must be present for the church to maintain unity. In verses 2 and 3, it is going to tell us the intentional, daily, purposeful actions that each member of the body of Christ must employ to maintain unity. Which means that unity is a choice of the people of God because of the mandate of the Son of God. And unity has nothing to do whether people worship like you, think exactly like you, or praise like you. Nothing. If you have my notes, what I'm trying to do is go through these opening statements. Um, I really pray about texts like this because uh, I think God has really given me a message for the church today. I, I tell people they... I, <laughs> Just don't know how transparent to become. I believe that I am a gift to the body of Baptist that they don't want. Because I am willing to be the hammer of God and not, not, not try to make everybody happy. It's a freedom that comes with being an interim. The only problem is I used to preach this way of my own church. That's why I had to leave, I guess. Because <laughs> the people of God want to sit and sing songs that talk about love and sing nice things about God and then 
walk out and crucify each other with their tongues and their actions. We want a real nice spiritual worship service, but we don't want the daily intentional death to self, love for others. The summary of this is almost 1 John 2, 6. We ought to walk as he walked. If we claim him as Lord, we ought to walk as he walked. 1 John 3, 16. As he laid down his life for others, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. The problem is we want to vote and control and not lay down in love. We want the church to look like us instead of the church to look like him. Every denomination has its strengths and weaknesses. I tell people, if you try to find the perfect church and you join it, you'll screw it up. Because you're weird. Because you're fallen. And all of us are fallen. Which means we've got to find a group that we kind of agree with, that we can work the Great Commission within, and we've got to love one another and, and realize that none of us are perfect. Verse 1, it's obvious that Paul is a, writing a prison letter. This is probably early 60s, probably Rome. Paul wrote Colossians to the heretics, knew that was going to spread, wrote Ephesians for all the churches in Turkey, and by implications, all the churches. First section is doctrinal, what we ought to believe, but now because of what we believe, now... And this, is the, this directly flows out of there are no more Jews, Gentiles, male, female, slave or free. If that's true, all human barriers are down in Christ. All human barriers. But the problem is all human barriers are not down in us. Now this walk worthy has always been a, amazing to me that... Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but the practical section, look at your Bibles, I hope you have them open, closes in Ephesians, the end of Ephesians 3, Paul prays for the church. The, the word church is a, is a play on the word call. It, it's made up of a preposition and the word call, ekklesia, ek kaleo, the called out. So now, it's not by accident, the first few verses of chapter 4 use the word called, kaleo, four times. Paul is picking up on what it means to be the church. What it means to have this riches and abundance that he's been talking about in these first three chapters. And we're to walk worthy. Now, I don't care what your view is on predestination, Calvinism, and all that. I want to say to you, walk worthy has to be an individual Christian choice response. Amen? Amen. You're not predestined to walk worthy. You're called on to walk worthy. Which means there is a mandated response to the grace of God. There is a normal response to being saved by grace. There is a a normal reaction to undeserved, unmerited grace. And it's not freedom, it's service. Now this is the practical section. It's quite er- uh, obvious when you look at the word call. Or, I mean, excuse me, the word walk. Walk worthy of the calling wherewith you've been called. That's chapter 4, verse 1. Look at verse 15. Walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. I mean, it's verse 17. Walk no longer as the Gentiles walk. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. Walk in love just as Christ also loved you. Look, look, at, look at 5.15. So it, we're into the metaphor of the Christian life, which is walk. Now, it's, this is not walk from here to there. This is live like. L- let your manner of life be like. So now we're called on. We're, we're, we're saved by the call of God, by the grace of God. Jew and Gentile are now one. Now, because of that, walk worthy. Walk so that other people can see that you know me. Walk so that other people can see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Live distinctly so that they will come to know me. Live differently now that you have an indwelling Holy Spirit and your sins are forgiven. 
and you're gifted for the kingdom. Walk worthy. And here, here is the list of characteristics that must be purposefully, intentionally, daily inaugurated by the individual believer for the intentionality of maintaining unity among the people of God. This is not for deacons or preachers or denominationally. This is every child of God's daily purposeful intentionality. If you're saved, this is the will of God for your life in the church. Now look at this list. With all humility. Now, humility is um, many of Paul's list of virtues and vices. And he has several are very, very similar to the list of the Greek philosophers known as the Stoics. Except for the word humility. Now, no Greek philosopher would list humility because they saw it as a weakness. They saw it as a milk toastness. I don't know if that's a word, but... But the problem is that there are two people called meek or humble in the Bible. Translation of the same word. One is Moses. I always get tickled. <laughs> Moses is called humble in Numbers 12, 3. And this is what it says. Moses, the most humble man that ever lived. Well, folks, Moses can't write that and do it. <laughs> now, you, that just shows there's an editor in the Pentateuch. You can't write, I'm the most humble man that ever lived. You can't do that, right? So that shows that I, I think that Moses wrote the the majority of Genesis through Deuteronomy, but it was put together by someone else with comments and updated. The second one is Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, where Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and lean on me for I am, and it's, you can translate it meek or humble, meek and lowly of mind and you'll find rest unto your soul. So here is Moses and Jesus, leader of the old covenant, leader of the new covenant, who choose to live in a humble, meek way, not aggressive, not assertive, which is exactly op opposite of our cultural tradition. You know, we, we train our children, grab the bull by the horns, take, take, actualize your potential, make the most of your opportunities, pull yourself up by your own bootstrap, be your own person, exactly opposite of the New Testament. Exactly opposite. We are still dominated by a frontier mentality instead of a corporate meekness. It's hard to be meek. It's hard to be humble. Only the Spirit of God can help us do that. Amen? No fallen creature can be meek and humble on their own because the essence of the fall is the opposites of humility. The second word is kind of interesting. I remember um, several years ago, I was preaching out in West Texas. <laughs> you know, sometimes preachers just try to show off. And I, my illustration for this Greek word is the Lone Ranger. Now, the word here is gentleness, but what it means in Greek is domesticated strength. So my little illustration was the Lone Ranger. Now, y'all don't know who the Lone Ranger is. He's a guy who rode a white horse on black and white TV. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, the, you, those are how many of you have seen The Lone Ranger? You ever watched Nick? And, sure, sure. Kimasabi. Once Tonto found out what that means. Well, um, so The Lone Ranger is about a hundred and what, 60 pound man. He's not a big guy. But how much that horse weigh? Well, see, I grew up in Houston. I don't know how much that stupid horse weighs, so I guessed. I never should have guessed. I said, this 160-pound man rode this 2,000-pound animal. And this farmer came up to me and said, I learned something new tonight in church. Well, I was impressed by that. <laughs> and he said, I didn't know that the Lone Ranger rode a Clydesdale. Well, <laughs> I don't know how big this stupid horse was. It's a big horse. Amen? And that little man controls that big horse. How? You say, with a bit. No, no, if you look at that, there is no bit in that horse on that television show. That horse has been trained to move at the rider's will. Now, that's what you're gifted for. You're gifted not for yourself, but to be controlled by the king's will. 
You understand what I'm saying to you? This is where I really started not agreeing with what used to be called the death to self movement. They used to say you have to die to self and Jesus flows through you and your personality goes. No, I know. I, I, the more I know the Bible, your personality was created by God, Psalm 139. And he made you physically and mentally, emotionally, and gifted you for the kingdom good. Now, we heard that in the children's sermon, but I want to reemphasize 1 Corinthians 12, 7. We are gifted for the common good. We've turned spiritual gifts into merit badges and their servant towels. God does not want to remove your personality. He wants to, listen to me, direct your personality for his honor and glory. No flesh will glory before God. No. God didn't get a good deal when he got you. Humility, gentleness, patience. Now, this, this word is, um, if you went to a Greek lexicon, what I'm going to say is one of the connotational choices. But every time this word is used in the New Testament, it refers to patience with people. Now, I try to use humor to get your attention. I hope you have realized that. And this is the way I try to accent this truth. Does anybody in this church get on your nerves? Anybody? If not, you don't go here. You think you're going to find a church, everybody agrees with you, looks like you, talks like you, think? No, no. The key is that we've been touched by Christ, and now we love the body for whom he died. And we live not for ourselves, but for the health, and growth, and if you let me put it here, unity of the body. Which means that I take a step back so others can take a step forward. That I don't always have to be in control. Doesn't always have to be my idea. Doesn't always have to be my favorite music. Doesn't always have to be the preacher with a certain personality type. Or dare I say our gender. Getting radical now, aren't I? We get, so, we get so blinded by what we're used to, we think what we're used to is the only way God does it. I've just been with enough women pastors around the world to know that God uses women. And when I get to that text, I'll teach it too. And if you don't like it, don't come that week. Or find a pastor. That'll do it. Showing forbearance to one another in love. Now, this is the same word that's often translated when we're talking about God, that God is long-suffering. That same, trans same word, just translated differently. God was long-suffering with you when you were a lost person, when you were an immature Christian, when you were an obnoxious Christian, when you thought you knew everything, everything ought to be done your way. God was patient with you until maturity came. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. The most miserable person to be around is a first-year seminary student. God was patient with you through your faults, and now he comes back to you and says, I loved you when you weren't. I want you to love these who I died for who are not yet there. And they may never get there. Because we're not told to change the two different kinds of believers into our kind. We're told to love them. Accept them. Don't pick fights with them. Cooperate for the Great Commission with them. Pray for them. And love them for the kingdom. You see, it's so different from American what's in it for me. This is not about you. It's about him. Long-suffering. Patience. This next little word in verse 3, I like the way the New English Bible does this. Its translation is, spare no effort. Now, my New American Standard says, being diligent to preserve. But I, I like the intensity of the New English Bible. You mean me, Bob, at whatever 
age of life, whatever stage of maturity, whatever spiritual gift I am, that it is a mandate in Scripture from an inspired author in a cyclical letter that I am to spare no effort. For what? Unity. Unity. One body. One Lord. One faith. It's coming up. It's coming up. The next paragraph. It's coming up. It's no longer about me. It's about the reputation of the church of Jesus Christ. It's about, if I read the papers, somebody said the one thing that's characterized Baptists throughout their history is not soul competency, not assurance, not, not belief in the Bible. It's been fighting. You read the newspaper, I wouldn't join this group. It's my mother's fault I'm here. But if I take Scripture seriously, if Scripture is the authoritative, inspired Word of God, only clear self-revelation, I am called to spare no effort. Whatever my giftedness is, whatever my personal opinions are, whatever my family traditions are, I am called on by the Spirit of God to spare no effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. How do I do that? Humility. Gentleness, patience, forbearance, intentionality every day. Now, I am sure there are some people here get on your nerves. Now, how do we handle it? Do we ridicule them? Do we isolate them? We affirm them and recognize that that person who gets on your on your nerves is probably the only one that can reach certain groups. And we empower them for great commission Christianity as we continue to do and be what we think to reach those we can reach for great commission Christianity. That in the end, the diverse richness of the body of Christ is the will of God as we are one as he is one, not in doctrinal understanding, not in giftedness, but in love one another, even as I have loved you. It's so easy to preach and so hard to live. So easy to say amen. So hard to embrace those who have wounded us. You are a moderate church. That's what you've always been. In Southern Baptist life, there's a, um, there is a uh, Baptist faith and message now that must be signed. If you are to teach, be, a, be hired by our convention, be a missionary in our convention... But the problem is, for some of us, we have, just, we have just strongly believed that we do not believe in creeds. We believe in the New Testament. And that Baptist history has been one where we have not used a creed. That creeds are good to explain to other groups that don't notice what we believe. But that the creeds put too tight of a noose around the giftedness of the people of God. And those who write the creeds... Try to put everybody in their box. And it's not that the creed is wrong. It's not that I disagree with the creed. I just can't sign a creed. So now the denomination that I've grown up in, gone to school with, there are churches that I can't preach in. I can't go as a missionary anymore in the Southern Baptist Convention. I can't teach a seminary class anymore. I've become the enemy because I won't sign a creed. I hope you can feel the pain that I feel over this. 
And we do this to each other. You don't like this? Well, you're just, you're liberal. Now there's no, please don't call me a liberal. Cuss me before you do that. We throw these words around at each other and act like we know. You're as broken as I am, you big weenie. Nobody puts you on the criticized committee. You aren't the standard for nothing. But you're called to love one another. You're called to unity. God have mercy. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Of all who is over all and through all and in all. <laughs> I'd just like to pray for a minute. Would you bow your head to me? I'm willing to be transparent with you because I go home and you don't control my life with your checkbook. But you have controlled some lives with your checkbook. There's a need for unity, which means those of you in control, in money, in longevity, must lay it down for the king. You've got to lay it down. I don't have to be like you to be accepted by Jesus. It's not what you believe is bad. It's just what you believe is not everything. It's not that we don't want some doctrinal integrity in our pulpits. Of course we do. But whose doctrinal integrity is it? The integrity of the New Testament or the integrity of a denominational creed? As I have been speaking, things have come to your mind. I know that. The Spirit does that. Situations, people. Some gone, some here. Some you love, some you really do not love. Those of you who are mature, whatever faction you belong to, those of you who are mature must respond to this sermon. You must respond in prayer. You must respond in a phone call. You must respond in a letter. You must respond in an I'm sorry. You must respond in an I love you. You, you must respond. There is no peace for the mature Christian that hears this message that refuses to lay down his rights and love one another. This church wants to be the light on this hill. She's got to be unified in love. If not, the days are marked until this place is locked up. The glories of the past will not reach the next generation. The memories of long ago patterns and ways will not reach this generation. I submit to you to lay down your preferences for the great commission call of God. I call on you to let go and let others 